sure. Yeah. Okay, that's it's fascinating to me to see where everybody's from and to hear a little bit about what they're doing and, and that kind of thing. Um, let me just quickly give my testimony and then what we can do is um, uh, take a break. Do we take a break during the two hour session generally? Yeah, that would be good, yep. Okay, well, I'll, I'll be fairly short. Um, do I need to, can, can students see me? At this yes, point? yep, yes. Okay. Well, um, <clears throat> I was not born into a Christian family. Uh, I came to know the Lord at approximately the age of 12. I don't remember exactly what year, what, how old I was, but I was, <clears throat> I watched an evangelist on TV. I was going at the time to a very a liberal church that did not believe the Bible was the word of God at all. And uh, this evangelist I heard on TV uh, let me know from the scripture that I was a sinner. And uh, I concurred with that <clears throat> as I listened to him. Uh, the Holy Spirit convicted my heart that I had I indeed, uh, even though I wasn't very old, I had, I had disobeyed my parents and I had lied and I, I was guilty of the whole law. And uh, on the basis of that, I was condemned uh, to an eternity in hell. And that frightened me. Uh, I, I wanted, to, wanted to hear how I could possibly have deliverance from my sin. And then the evangelist told me that Christ died for my sin. He loved me so much that he went to Calvary's cross, shed his blood for me to pay the payment for my sin. I was overwhelmed that Christ would do that for me. And at the end of the, the evangelist's TV message, he said, you can accept Christ as your personal Savior right in your own home. Uh, right there in the living room, if you're watching me in the living room, or go up to your bedroom and do it. I went up to my bedroom, and the first time in my life, I really prayed. And I told God that I was a sinner, and that I needed Christ as my Savior. And uh, just a tremendous burden lifted off of me to know that God had forgiven me for my transgressions, and that uh, now I could have a new life in Christ. Unfortunately, we kept going to that liberal church, and it wasn't until I was a senior in high school that somebody invited us to go to a Bible preaching church. <clears throat> that was that was life. That was the next big life revelation to me <laughs> that there was a church where the pastor believed the Bible and preached the Bible, and so I started going there <clears throat> all through my four years of my undergraduate chemical engineering degree, uh, I was going to a Bible pre preaching church and I was working on campus evangelizing through a Christian uh, missions organization on the Syracuse University campus where I did my undergraduate work. <clears throat> now, when I graduated, I considered going into full-time Christian service, but I didn't know what that might be. And I wanted to at least work some in what I had prepared myself for, for four years. Uh, <clears throat> one thing about chemical engineering, it's very, very difficult. And I didn't want to just waste all that training. So I thought, well, I'll try the paper industry. This was, that was where I was uh, trained to work. And so I was a process engineer for the paper industry for four years. And finally, uh, it just became apparent to me that uh, my heart was not in that, it was in ministry. And so in 1978, I came to Bob Jones, Univers Bob Jones University, enrolled in the seminary, uh, got a Master of Divinity degree in 1982, and then I stayed for a PhD in Old Testament, uh, graduated in that in 1987. Uh, initially, I taught um, at uh, Maranatha Baptist Bible College, which is now Maranatha Baptist University in, in Watertown, Wisconsin, and pastored a church, well, I actually planted a church called 
Fellowship Baptist Church in Watertown. And then the Lord called me back to Bob Jones to teach in 1991. And uh, up until May, that's what I've been doing uh, for 28 years, plus five years at Maranatha. So I've been, I served the Lord in teaching ministry for 33 years. It was a great delight. It's been, it's been amazing serving the Lord. I can't imagine doing anything else. If I had stayed in the, as a process engineer, I would have led a boring life, but it hasn't been boring. Uh, it's been great uh, teaching students uh, from all over the world, really. And now to have this opportunity is a great blessing for me. I'm glad to have each one of you in class. and I trust the class will be a terrific blessing to you personally. Okay, well, let's take a 10-minute uh, break. According to my clock, it's 9.04. So come back and what, what do you do? Take about a 10-minute break? That sounds good, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yep. yep. All yep. right. So 9.14. I'm going to finish this row of crochet and go take my shower. I've been enjoying listening in. 
Adelaide's feeling better this morning. When I went in after the five minutes and then on a separate test that didn't have your phone because I didn't know if your phone was buzzed or buzzed. Ah, I got the ringer off. It might buzz.
We're ready when you are, if you haven't started, Dr. Yee. Okay, <clears throat> now, uh, how, how did you instruct me to get the um, PowerPoint uh, on present mode? I don't remember. Um, it, this is fine the way it is right now, or let's see, if, I, if you click, was it Alt? Um, PowerPoint um, presenter mode key. Yeah, it was like Alt. <laughs> oh, here we go. I got it, I think. Okay, great. Uh, all right, let's talk about uh, the need for a study of the book of Ecclesiastes. And basically, I would argue that uh, we have a very sad state of secular philosophies today. You ask the average person, just go out on the street and ask them, what's the meaning of your life? What are you living for? Uh, to what purpose? Uh, when you get to the end of your life, what's the purpose of your life going to be, if you had to sum it up? And I think the average person would not have too much of a clue unless he'd taken a course in school, something like modern philosophy. Most people these days, at least in the Western world, I can't speak uh, to the Eastern world, but Western philosophies uh, center in um, much around the idea of existentialism. And so why the message of Ecclesiastes needs to be heard as never before is essentially because existentialism has swept uh, the world system view of how they deal with their lives. And uh, so let's talk a little bit here about uh, how existentialism has become pervasive. And we're going to talk as well about particular kinds of existentialist belief. Well, I had to notice, first of all, <clears throat> that existentialism emphasizes the existence of the individual person as a free, responsible agent, determining their own development through acts of the will. Existentialism really emphasizes uh, do something, act, decide to do, to do something uh, on the basis of your own rational analysis of what you think uh, reality should be and how you believe that um, you should conduct your life. You're the only one who makes reality happen for you Nobody else ought to be making your mind up for you. You are uh, existentialism em emphasizes the free actions of the individual when it comes to determining what he's going to live his life like. What are his standards of conduct going to be? Is there any truth really that can be known? Uh, how should he relate to other people? Existentialism says you're on your own, brother figure it out. And uh, above all, don't let anybody else tell you what to do. There is no such thing as objective truth. There is no such thing as objective morality. Uh, you are the one who calls the shots. And of course, in that kind of free and open philosophical environment, people are coming up with some rather bizarre conclusions about how they ought to live these days. And so we, we have to recognize that there are a lot of people who don't have a clue what they're doing in life, but they're, they're deciding they're going to act. Uh, in the advertising world, this uh, comes across uh, with, uh, for instance, the... Um, the Nike uh, slogan, advertising slogan, just do it. Well, what is it? I, you know, and, and the answer is, it is whatever you want to do. 
whatever if you feel like uh, you need to, to conquer, we'll give you the athletic shoes and the, and the athletic apparel so that you can accomplish your goals. Uh, you can be a strong individual. You can, you can um, have personal goals of physical achievement and we'll be sure that we supply you with what you need. Just do it. And it's, it doesn't matter what the it is. Just choose something to do and then do it. Uh, so it's, it's, it's all around us everywhere we look. Uh, even Budweiser commercials for Budweiser beer says, uh, you only go around in, in life once, better grab for all the gusto you can. Well, but is it proper? Uh, that's, that's not the issue. The question is, what do you want to do? Just, just uh, act, choose to do something. You validate your existence by what you choose to do. That's existentialism. Basically, humans define their own meaning in life and make rational decisions despite the fact that they exist in an irrational universe. To the existentialist, nothing is set, nothing is, is objective, it's just you in a universe that doesn't make any sense at all. Of course, uh, the uh, modern scientist is there by his, uh, his views of Darwinism to tell the person, you know, you're a cosmic accident. There's no reason why you should exist. Uh, basically, there's no reason why anything in the universe should exist. There was a huge big bang at the beginning. And now look, you're on a little speck uh, called planet Earth in a vast universe of billions of light years across, and the fact that on Earth, life arose <clears throat> and then evolved to the point where here you are, and uh, you, you are, your existence is so unlikely, it could end and will end because all people die, and so you've got a small window of opportunity here to just to decide to do stuff. And uh, you're the one who's calling the shots. So call the shots, that's, that's it. Okay, now let's take a look at uh, some of the types. Mainly, the, uh, we can categorize these by their proponents. Once again, I only know to speak to Western philosophical existentialists. I have no idea what's going on in the East, but you know, even if you live in the East, you can perhaps understand what drives the Western world in their, in their personal philosophies. Uh, the first person I want to talk about here is Soren Kierkegaard, went from 1813 to 1855. And so what is he, 42 when he died, fairly young. Kierkegaard came from a Lutheran background. He's Danish, and as I recall, his father was a uh, Lutheran pastor. Uh, he had become disenchanted with the um, dogmatic uh, teaching of the Lutheran church, and he felt like there wasn't any heart in it. Uh, so he could be considered, I suppose, in a way, a religious existentialist. <clears throat> Uh, basically, uh, the individual person is the center of his existence and must create whatever uh, he desires to be himself, since there's no set absolute meaning in life. And so it's, uh, it's, up, to, it's up to the individual to uh, make up his mind what he is going to do, uh, He's the only reality, reality he really understands and really knows. Kierkegaard said that God is a necessary belief. 
But for Kierkegaard, God is not someone you can know and have a relationship with. God is what he called the absolute, uh, absolute perfection. And therefore, man realizes he always falls short of, the, I, of what the absolute expects of him. And uh, this leads to anguish in man until finally <clears throat> man decides to take a leap of faith in surrendering to God's will. But once again, it's not a God you can know. It's just a God who exists out there and you're trying to find him and who knows how he even, how he's even, re has, has he even told man what he expects of him? No, somehow man's got to, got to make this, this surrender to the absolute. And then hopefully he finds uh, some kind of touchstone with the absolute God. It's, it's a sad kind of an existence. Next, we have Friedrich Nietzsche. Uh, he was German, lived from 1844 to 1900. So what he lived for uh, 56 years. Uh, reality, according to Nietzsche, is subjective. And objectivity cannot be found because it does not exist. Anytime you're talking with unsaved people these days, most likely you are talking to somebody who believes that all truth is subjective. There's no such thing as objective truth. That seems to be a commonality that runs through all of modern philosophy, especially existentialism. His teaching, central teaching, was the will to power. This was the central concept he thought all people should be working towards. Now, this will to power leads to greatness fearlessness, and perpetual overcoming. Uh, essentially, uh, Nietzsche's philosophy was massively influential in Adolf Hitler's uh, particular personal uh, way to look at, at life. Hitler was all about the will to power. Really, would there have even been an Adolf Hitler without the philosophical foundation of Nietzsche, I doubt it. Uh, and this, this fueled Germany's aggression, both in the First World War and in the, uh, in the Second as well. Uh, for Hitler, as well as for Nietzsche, the, the key thing was that the will to power would produce an Übermensch, which is basically higher man, man as he begins to unleash his true potential of, once again, greatness, greatness, fearlessness, and perpetually overcoming his difficulties and, and moving on to new heights. And so uh, they uh, began to emphasize this concept of the higher man. And for Nietzsche, man is a bridge between beast and God. But of course, once again, uh, Nietzsche had no idea who this God really was. It was just um, a divine power somewhere out there that maybe you could connect with. Uh, you know, because man's just floating around in a senseless universe and has to try to make the best sense of life as he can. All right, next we come up with uh, Martin Heidegger, also a German, <clears throat> and he's pretty much of a contemporary modern uh, philosopher, basically a 20th century philosopher. And uh, his big idea was the importance of what he called Dasein, uh, or a person's being. Uh, 
rarely do people contemplate why they are here. Well, you know, what's rather than why they're not someplace else or <laughs> what, their, what their reason for existing is. Uh, for Heidegger, he loved to go for a walk in the forest and just notice how everything is beautiful, it all fits together, um, everything has its place in the forest, um, everything fulfills its function. Why? Because God designed it that way? Oh no, not, not for Heidegger. It's just this is the way uh, evolution has worked out and uh, it's, we, we need to be able to understand what our purpose is in the world. Uh, it, but once again, nobody's telling us that. It's up to the individual to determine. And by the way, I might say, I love to, go, I love to walk through the woods too. Uh, and uh, one, of my, one of my hobbies is deer hunting. And so in the fall, I spend a lot of time in the woods. But I don't do it to try to figure out what my place in, an, in, an, in, a, in a big irrational world is. I go looking at what the creator God has, has created and appreciate his, his wisdom and his, his majestic power and all that he has made. Uh, for Heidegger, the opposite of das Sen is das Nicht, uh, or what he called nothingness. And for Heidegger, we're all running away from this das Nicht. Uh, we, we fear death. We, we fear this nothingness. And of course, for these existentialists, when a person dies, they just cease to exist and they go into nothingness. Their bodies rot, there, there is no everlasting soul that a person has. And so uh, this nothingness is the antithesis of life and dasen. Uh, Heidegger as well said that we've all forgotten our interconnectedness with all of life and we become egoistic we focused only on ourselves. Uh, and so <clears throat> what we need to do is realize uh, that we have, a, we have a function to serve. Uh, we, we need to be realizing, for instance, when we go for a walk in the forest, that, that we are related to the other life forms we see. Uh, we have evolved from some of those lot lower life forms. And we have a function that is up to us to determine what we are going to uh, focus on. But we need to get our focus outside of ourselves so we'll understand what the purpose of our being is. Uh, and we need to experience this interconnectedness with all of life before the nothingness gets us, Das Nix. He recommended spending time as well in graveyards uh, to understand that our time is limited. <clears throat> what we do, we'd better do quickly uh, because the way to live is to realize that uh, we are not going to be here very long. As we, uh, Heidegger would say, when you're in the graveyard, take a look at how short a length of time people lived. Actually, uh, Heidegger lived to be older than many philosophers. He, he was 76 plus 11, so he was 87 years old when he died, one of the oldest, <laughs> one of the, oldest uh, of the uh, philosophers. But he said that we, we live the best when we understand that we don't have a lot of time, which is kind of interesting because, in fact, now he's touching on something that uh, Solomon's going to emphasize in the book of Ecclesiastes. It's, it's sort of uh, eerie the way some of these modern philosophers at times could even 
touch on an area that the Bible presents as truth, as biblical truth, and they just sort of stumble on it. And uh, of course, they have a completely different perspective on uh, why they're even talking about it, but it is quite interesting that they can actually uh, understand what's going on. So that's Heidegger. Next, we come across a guy who really is a very strange individual, Jean-Paul Sartre. Uh, when I took high school French, Senior, we had for a teacher a former French nun who was uh, very, very uh, insistent that we learn French culture as well as the French language. And in French culture, Sartre is huge. Uh, he was kind of an interesting guy. He was only five foot three. And, and his eyes pointed in different directions. I suppose if his parents had realized, you know, that they could be corrected surgically, uh, because he lived from 1905 to 1980, and I suppose surgeons could have corrected his, his vision or his eyesight, but they didn't. And so he looked very strange. You see pictures of him and one eye's pointing in one direction, the other eye's pointing in the other direction. He wasn't a very good looking guy. He was kind of weird looking. And he described himself as ugly, all right? So not exactly <clears throat> a great start in life and he didn't have a very call positive self image. But anyway, here were some of his main teachings. Uh, number one, and this is, this is foundational to everything he believed, things are weirder than we think they are. The world is absolutely absurd. Nothing makes any sense. Don't try to make sense out of it. You can't do it because it's absurd. Number two, as free individuals, we know that we could make the world much better, but we fail to make the world better. And so we experience a certain anguish over the fact that we're not making a difference. And it's extremely frustrating to us. Aha, now we're at another touchstone with the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, the book of Ecclesiastes, in fact, <clears throat> causes us to realize that um, the world is in a mess uh, because God has subjected it to Hevel. That's the Hebrew word that describes what the English versions more or less translate as vanity. Um, the world doesn't make any sense many times. And in fact, there are times when we say uh, the world is absurd. Just about the time we think things are going well, something happens and it's out of our control and it just destroys everything we thought we were building. Uh, you, get a, you might get a person, for instance, who his whole life long is saving for retirement. That's what I'm doing now. I've, I've saved for years for retirement. Uh, what happens if um, next week the stock market crashes and all the money that I've saved up for retirement is lost? Well. Sartre would say, yep, that's it, life's absurd, you know, uh, that's what we expect, and uh, you can't make any difference in it, it's, it's, it's happened to you, so that produces anguish, and get used to it, that's life. Well, in fact, there's a certain truth to that. Uh, we can't figure life out, it's, it's enigmatic to us. And so uh, Sartre would say, yep, sure is. And he said we should not live in bad faith, what he called bad faith. Uh, to him, that was the idea that, yes, indeed, we can change things if we work 
hard enough at it. Um, and we, we, of course, are the ones who make up our minds what we're going to work toward. Uh, it's, it's not, no one is telling us that, it's just that our own rational being decides, I know best, best how things could change for the better, and I'm going to work towards that. And even though life is absurd, I'm still going to work for change. Now, change for Sartre was uh, uh, kind of disturbing to me personally, because he thought that we must dismantle capitalism and uh, adopt Marxism. He was a Marxist. He once again uh, was somebody who would have been very, very enthusiastic about uh, communist takeovers of different countries. And uh, he thought that socialism uh, was the goal. Uh, capitalism was, was bad and was the, was the uh, philosophy and the, and the practice that had made millions of people uh, miserable. Whereas, uh, in my opinion, it's quite the opposite. Uh, capitalism, wherever it goes, has helped people um, uh, lift themselves out of economic poverty and uh, despair. And everywhere Marxism has gone, it's been quite the opposite. There's been nothing but human misery, death, and destruction. But um, that, was, that was what Sartre thought. All right, now let's take a look at, you may, you may say to yourself at this point, how many of these philosophers are we going to have to talk about? Well, Albert Camus is the last one we'll talk about. Just giving you a feel for some of the main Western philosoph uh, modern philosophical thought that's out there and that has influenced people, even though many times they don't realize it. Uh, and for Camus, he basically had the idea that everything is absurd. In other words, it's a lot like Jean-Paul Sartre. Man can never find meaning in life, although he searches for it diligently. Uh, he's never going to solve the puzzle. Uh, and so, once again, this is, this is something like what uh, Ecclesiastes is going to be maintaining. Uh, people are going to try to find meaning in their lives, and unless they find it in the fear of the Lord, they're going to be very disappointed. And of course, for Camus, uh, led nothing to to nothing but disappointment. There were only three ways to deal with the tension that results from Camus's absurdism. Now, notice that number one, suicide. Uh, existentialism is the philosophical foundation of suicide because this person who kills himself recognizes that, hey, I'm never going to find meaning in life. Life is absurd. I might as well go ahead and exercise the ultimate way that I validate my existence, which is to kill myself. Doesn't that sound strange? Well, it was for Camus uh, one way out of this tension that, it, that existed in the human condition. The second possible way a person could get out of the tension is a leap of faith. And in his leap of faith is different from Kierkegaard's. Uh, his leap of faith was, well, even though life doesn't have any meaning, I'm just going to go ahead and commit myself to try to create my own meaning, and I'm just going to go for it. So, for instance, let's say you have a person, and he might declare, he might decide for himself that, the, that life has meaning in earning money and accumulating money and the power that goes with it. is going to be all about making money. Of course, 
in much of the world today, uh, that kind of materialism is, is fueling people's activity all over the world. Uh, and especially in the Western world, uh, materialism has become uh, just rampant. This is what everything's about these days for some people. Uh, and then the third, the third way that Camus uh, thought we could deal with the absurd was to just accept it in a stoic kind of manner. Yes, this is the way life is. It's absurd. It doesn't make any sense. Um, and I'm just going to accept that and, and live anyway and make the most of what I can out of my life, experience some happiness. Uh, but uh, basically, I'm, I'm giving up trying to find any kind of meaning. All right, so here we have a situation where these kinds of existentialist philosophies are, even if the people don't realize it, they are foundational to human belief these days. And it produces despair or anguish or unfulfillment, sadness, just leaves people realizing that uh, they are downright miserable. And that's the way a lot of people live. They have various ways to deal with that. Um, in America, many times, the way people deal with this is to become a drug user or an alcoholic, just drink themselves senseless or drug themselves into an anesthetized state so they escape for at least a little bit this overwhelming despair that exists in their lives. And, and so every once in a while now, it's going to be more common that people inadvertently or even on purpose give themselves uh, too much of a particular drug, for instance, an opiate. And, and if, they, if they do, they, they end up committing suicide. Or if they don't, if they, if they stay one step short of, of a lethal dose of opiates, at least they can get away from the absurd for a short amount of time. We have a horrendous problem of drunkenness. And this shows up on uh, our nation's, America's highways, where we have people who, because they're driving under the influence of alcohol, cause horrific traffic wrecks uh, with the death of innocent people. It's extremely sad. Uh, and all of these societal problems stem from the fact that the people are miserable. They need to hear the message of the book of Ecclesiastes, that God is the giver of life, and he expects us to reverence him, and to live life in relationship with him. And it's only then that we understand that he is the one that we must look towards, even when we don't understand what's happened, because indeed he has subjected, subjected the world to vanity. It is in response to man's sin in the Garden of Eden. And the book of Ecclesiastes looks much to the first three chapters uh, of, the book of, Ecclesi of the book of Genesis. So let's talk just briefly about how man needs the message of Ecclesiastes. Yes. Um, just one comment from a student. Um, there was a little, a short, very short discussion on uh, some of the overlap between Western and Eastern philosophies. And Joseph, one of the students, said that, um, so the question was asked uh, regarding uh, what are some of the things that are overlapping and affecting even like Confucius, in a Confucius context. Uh, in folk B Buddhism, and of course a, a, lot of, a lot of countries that are Buddhist or Hindu or even Muslim, they, they don't practice a pure uh, practice of that religion. They have a folk practice of that. And he says a folk, in folk Buddhism here in Cambodia, 
Western existentialism is not particularly remarkable to the fish and, fish and water. The absurdity of life has been acknowledged for centuries only to be solved through denial and reincarnation. And um, uh, Phil Kay said, I don't think Filipinos are usually philosophical. Um, they seem to be more pragmatic, but like I think all people, they pursue happiness. Existentialism has some influence, but it's not that strong because they are mostly Catholics and thus traditionalists who recognize the external authority of the church. So those were a couple of comments just to, in, in light of. Very interesting. Yeah. yeah. Thank, you. Thank you very much uh, to those who made those comments, because essentially I don't know very much at all uh, about uh, Asian philosophies. And in fact, I have never been east of uh, Ukraine. <laughs> uh, and Israel, I guess Israel is pretty much uh, about as, e as far east as I've ever been. That's the Near East, not the Far East. So it's extremely interesting to hear these comments. And of course, in America, there are those still who are adherents of Catholicism or liberal Protestantism. Um, and these these religious kind of people who don't know the Lord, but they're religious, uh, once again, do have some knowledge of what objective truth is. There's, there's a remnant of that uh, within these systems. As a matter of fact, I've witnessed to some Roman Catholics here in America who claim to be evangelical Catholics. And, uh, they're very, very interesting talking with these people. They don't recognize, I guess, what the uh, true teaching of the Roman Catholic Church is over the uh, centuries and how unbiblical much of it is, but, um, or else they wouldn't be a part of the, of the, of the church. But um, it's, it is uh, quite interesting that there are, even in uh, cultures that are definitely affected by existentialism. There are people who are holding, at least in uh, traditional form, a particular religious belief. So thank you much. Uh, all right, so why is it that man needs the message of Ecclesiastes? Well, basically man-made philosophy simply allows mankind to wallow in self-pity with no objective direction. And after you've lived that way for a while, life gets to be uh, a burden instead of, of what it should be, uh, something that we enjoy in our relationship with God. We want to notice that Solomon was a realist. It's interesting, people try to make Solomon a pessimist or an optimist or uh, whatever they, they, they see. Some even try to, to make Solomon an existentialist. That's what really annoys me. But what Solomon was, he was a realist. He took a look at, at, uh, at how the human condition is, and he said, well, because of man's sin, God has subjected the world to Hevel. That's our English word, that's so crucial to the meaning of the book of Ecclesiastes. That's what the English versions translate, translate vanity. But the book of Ecclesiastes has some revolution, some revolutionary news for us. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Solomon says, look, life is God's gift to man. And we must enjoy this wonderful life that is a while we walk in the fear of Yahweh, the fear of the Lord. So that's, that, uh, there are these, these uh, three main foci in the book. The world is got, God is subjected to the world to Hevel. Nevertheless, life is God's gift to man, and we enjoy it as we walk in the fear of the Lord. And the fear of the Lord is essentially 
uh, a description of what it is to know God and to walk with him while we have the opportunity in this life. Uh, so basically, this is the theme we're going to investigate during our class sessions together. It's going to be uh, the theme. We're going to see how it works out specifically through the book. And um, hopefully, we're going to be able to see how important Ecclesiastes is. Um, it's, it's going to show you that, in fact, life, because it's subjected to Hevel, life can really rise up and whack you right across the face when you're not even expecting it. Just uh, Christians go through tragic circumstances just like everyone else does. Um, one of my former students, just as an example of this, uh, went through <clears throat> the gut-wrenching situation <clears throat> where her, her young child came down with cancer and after a valiant battle uh, died. And um, this is it's just so tragic. It's gut-wrenchingly tragic. Parents are supposed to enjoy their children, and they're supposed to watch them grow through their, through their childhood years and have childhood experiences, and then finally get married and have their own kids, and all that cut short. That's what we're talking about with Hevel. But in spite of the fact that Christians go through what everybody else goes through in life, we don't look at it the same way. We don't conclude life is absurd, it doesn't make any sense, and we just might as well go out and kill ourselves. No, we conclude life is God's gift to man, and whether it lasts a short amount of time or what we would consider to be a, a very old age death, uh, we walk with the Lord. And we, re we recognize there's a time of accountability coming. We are going to have to answer to the cre our creator for how we live this life. And we better have lived it by faith in him. So I hope that uh, you are looking forward to what the Lord can do in using this material in both your own heart and as well how the Lord can use this material to help you win other people to Christ. Because ultimately, <clears throat> as we look at Ecclesiastes as a philosophy, a divine philosophy for living, there are going to be times when we can come alongside even our unsaved acquaintances and say, you know, the scripture, the Bible speaks to what you're going through right now. And uh, if you would accept Christ, Christ is your personal savior, you could have a, a supernatural strength and a joy in knowing the God who gave you this gift of life. And even in spite of how things are going in your life, you can have, you can have love and joy and peace and patience as, as the Lord leads you through this difficulty. You can glorify God by having the right kind of overall philosophy as to how you live through even the circumstances that ruin other people. And so I hope you're looking forward to this, <clears throat> and we're going to delve into, at times, we're going to get specific about the Hebrew text, and I'll try to keep this uh, as much oriented to those of you who don't know Hebrew as possible. There are some of you I, I recognize that, that do have facility in Hebrew, uh, but <clears throat> for those of you who don't, don't worry. Uh, Lord willing, I'll do, do a good job of explaining what the significance of the Hebrew is. Uh, and that's the way I wrote my book, Embrace Life Under the Sun. I wrote it not just for uh, Hebrew scholar, 
but I wrote it for pastors or Sunday school teachers and for serious persons, members of churches who just want to be better students of the scripture and to be able to handle the word of God as those who are skilled in, um, in Holy Spirit interpretation according to good hermeneutic interpretational um, principles. So I trust this will be uh, a blessing to each one of you and that you will Okay, Kevin. Yes. Uh, Thank you so uh, much. I think we're about done with our first yep. session, Channel One, by my watch. Yes. Buddy, back on Thursday. Yes. So we had uh, ten students today, and I've invited others to invite their uh, congregations because I think although this is we're going to be looking at things very much from a scholarly angle. Um, I think it could be very practical, the lectures themselves, for people as we go through these really key themes about life. So feel free to invite others if they want to just jump in for the, for the, um, for the lectures. I don't typically say that in these courses, but, you know, but I, I, do, I do think the content that, like this is, I think is very practical for um, those in our churches as well. So thank you so much, Dr. Yeagley, and uh, we'll see you, Lord willing, on Thursday. All right. Looking forward to it. Yes. Okay. Take care.